Tonight's strike averted at WestJet, but customers can't avoid the chaos. Stranded, delayed, and fed up at the airport. I'm seriously thinking not traveling anymore. Why passengers could still be in for a turbulent summer. Alberta braces for a dangerous weekend ahead. It's scary because it's so close to home. And after another playoff loss, the Leafs lose their GM. I think at that point, there was a shift in, in, in my thinking, a dramatical shift. In... This is The National with Ian Hennemansing. A frustrating and chaotic start to a busy travel weekend for many WestJet customers. Their travel plans upended by a, a pilot strike that never materialized. The airline struck a new contract deal with its 1,800 pilots at the very last minute, but not before cancelling hundreds of flights, leaving many unable to fly out and others wondering how they'll get home. WestJet says it's now scrambling to get those affected customers back in the air. Here's Ithil Musa on how passengers are reacting and how this new deal could affect the cost of flying. The dispute between WestJet and its pilots' union may be over, but not before many travelers saw their long weekend plans thrown into chaos. After hours on hold, waiting for news just to find their flights canceled. You were missing out on a weekend with my daughter. I paid a good decent chunk of money for the trip and now unfortunately we're kind of at a standstill. I'm seriously thinking not traveling anymore. Anticipating a strike, WestJet canceled over 200 flights this week, leaving many travelers stranded or looking for alternatives in a market with few options. If you're a Canadian and you're flying, you, you've got two, maybe three choices. The airlines know that. And so do airline employees, says industry expert Ian Lee. He says the combination of low supply and high demand gave WestJet pilots the edge as they demanded improvements to job security, scheduling and pay in a market where Canadian pilots make about half what their American counterparts do. We were able to secure uh, job protections, better uh, financial conditions and better scheduling rules. So I think we, we accomplished all of our goals. Experts say union and management labor relations are changing to the benefit of workers and more airline labor disruptions could be on the horizon. Bargaining power is shifting uh, to workers and labor and unions. Uh, I'm not saying they're going to have complete power, but they're going to have a lot more power than they did before. But that could mean higher prices down the road, says former Air Canada executive Duncan D. At the end of the day, any of these wage settlements result in increased airfares. Just like any wage settlement, any in the economy results in increased prices. With the deal expected to be ratified in the coming weeks, WestJet is asking for patience as it works to get its flight schedule back on track. And we look forward to ensuring that our guests can safely get where they need to go. Ethel, any word on when WestJet's schedule could get back to normal? Well, it could be a few days yet, Ian. Industry experts say it will be at least Sunday before WestJet gets back up to its normal operations. Of course, this is all happening while the travel season is starting to ramp up. And people will also be keeping a close eye on WestJet's main competitor, Air Canada. Its pilots will be going to the bargaining table this summer before their 10-year contract expires in September. They're also asking for higher wages and better benefits. All right, Ithil, thank you. For many in Alberta, it's going to be a hot and dangerous Victoria Day weekend as sections of the province continue to burn. There are now 93 active wildfires in the province, 25 of them out of control. More than 10,000 Albertans are out of their homes, and with nearly 830,000 hectares of forest burned, this is already one of Alberta's worst fire years in decades, and it's only May. It means that a dozen provincial parks and recreation areas are closed this weekend. And as Julie Wong explains, that's both to keep people safe and keep the fire activity down. Still have a voice. Alberta's wildfires mean the long weekend looks a bit different for Aaron Bookstrucker. We can't have fires, so we have the propane fires going, but um, yeah, that's about it. We're still enjoying what we can with what we have given to us. Some campers are keeping watch in case a wildfire that was three kilometers from the nearby town flares up again. First thing we thought of is if we ever get caught down in the campground, how do we evacuate quickly? 
Campers here say they're much more on guard and vigilant because they've seen what the wildfires have done in this province. And officials hope all Albertans do the same as we head into the long weekend. With the fire danger high, many provincial parks are closed and Albertans have been asked to restrict activities as hot and dry conditions are expected. May long weekend is traditionally a time when we see a spike in human caused wildfires and human caused wildfires are entirely preventable. In Alberta's northwest, a seniors facility in McLennan is under a voluntary evacuation order. Some families are making tough decisions. She's got uh, dementia mm -hmm. and as soon as you take them out of their routine, they are lost and it just takes forever to get them back to mm -hmm. like uh, they feel secure again. The severity of the wildfires is obvious. Thick smoke has settled over much of Alberta, inescapable to everyone. I especially noticed it last night. I feel like I've got acid in my throat um, and I've just been really lightheaded. Back in Devon, an attempt to enjoy the outdoors while keeping an eye on the skies. It gets scary because it's so close to home. As the wildfires enter yet another volatile weekend. Julia Wong, CBC News, Devon, Alberta. Saskatchewan First Nations leaders are demanding an inquiry into how police handled a domestic abuse case. This after a report found those officers failed to do their jobs. And as Sam Sampson tells us, hours later, a 13-month-old baby was found dead. Someone time it? Chief Bobby Cameron demonstrates what he says could have made the difference. 19 seconds it took to walk from that entrance to here. A new report suggests if police had gone inside Kyla Frenchman's home last February, 13-month-old Tanner Brass may still be alive. Had that been a white mother and a white baby in that apartment, they would have immediately went and saved that baby. The report states Frenchman called 911 to her home that night, saying the father assaulted her. The officers came, but despite knowing the baby was there, never went inside. They believed they needed a warrant or permission. The report found they needed neither, and not going into the home was against the service's own domestic violence policy to make sure all children are safe. Every uh, police service has some sort of policy manual dealing with domestic violence calls. Uh, the big challenge is training. The report says Frenchman didn't have anywhere to go. The officers offered her a holding cell. Despite her being sober, they logged her as drunk so she could stay. There are um, protocols in Saskatchewan that a woman leaving a domestic violence situation, especially if she has children, has to be offered a hotel space. Like there shouldn't be, uh, you can go into cells. Police left the child with the father. Hours later, the baby was dead. The father faces a second degree murder charge. First Nations leaders demand an inquiry into the baby's death, an investigation into the Prince Albert Police Service, and for all involved officers to be fired. With no charges, officer discipline falls to the police chief, who resigned Thursday. John Bergen said he was leaving the force, citing internal harassment. The only time Brass's mother moved Friday was to receive a star blanket, cradled by community as she grieves a life barely started. This is our gift to you. Sam Sampson, CBC News, Toronto. There is a number of resources if you or anyone you know is experiencing domestic violence, including the websites on the screen. And if you're in need of immediate assistance, call 911. The Prime Minister is in Japan tonight, where the G7 is tightening sanctions on Russia yet again, this time in a push to ensure the war in Ukraine doesn't escalate to a point of no return. Ashley Burke is also in Japan, with the high-stakes message being sent to the Kremlin. G7 leaders honoring the lives lost. They walked on the same ground where the world's first atomic bomb exploded. This was the only structure left standing. A haunting reminder as the world faces growing nuclear threats. Canada and its G7 allies issued a statement calling on Russia to end its nuclear blackmail and return to disarmament and arms control. You and I have now signed the Hiroshima Accords. Then unleashed new sanctions. More than 70 new sanctions uh, on uh, entities and individuals complicit in the military actions against Ukraine, uh, but also people who are uh, complicit in the human rights violations. 
For its part, the EU is restricting the import of Russian diamonds, a multi-billion dollar industry. Russian diamonds are not forever. But these leaders still face a problem. How to crack down on those who aren't part of their alliance, helping Russia evade their sanctions. India's prime minister is among those invited to observe the G7. There are um, technical uh, loopholes, Russian oil going to India, India refining it, but the products, uh, the higher value added that India sends into uh, Europe and elsewhere, legal. Ukraine's president says his priority this week is calling on allies for more modern weapons and aircrafts. The U.S. has now signaled it won't block EU allies from sending F-16 jets to Ukraine. President Vladimir Zelensky was supposed to address the G7 virtually, but instead he's coming here in person. A senior Ukrainian official said that important decisions are being made and that it's essential that he's here. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Hiroshima. Zelensky is expected to make his way to Japan from Saudi Arabia. That's where he met with global leaders from the Arab world. But as Paul Hunter shows us, it was another president involved in another grueling war who stole the spotlight. There he is, labeled by so many a monster, in a brutal civil war that's left nearly half a million dead, many millions displaced, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad now welcomed back to the Arab League with open arms and two kisses from Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. The Arab world can now reposition itself, he said, in a world of Western dominance that lacks principles, manners, friends and partners. Assad's return to the league was led by the Saudis, who say after a dozen years of war, this may help end the crisis. Other Arab leaders seemed all good with that, though the emir of Qatar, a staunch Assad opponent, walked out before Assad spoke. And in northern Syria, hundreds protested what they called the normalization of Syria's president. Likewise, the U.S. continues to sanction the Assad regime. The activist daughter of a Syrian man missing in his country for years puts it this way. Instead of normalizing Assad now after 12 years, they should have, you know, held him accountable for the war crimes they've committed, for the war crimes that he is, most importantly, for the war crimes he is still committing. But Assad was hardly the only leader of note at the summit. Please, Vladimir Zelensky. Thank you. In a surprise visit, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, who called on Arab nations... To help protect our people, including Ukrainian Muslim community. And so it was on the day longtime Russian ally Syria was welcomed back to the Arab League warmly. Zelensky pulled no punches, accusing some in the room of turning a blind eye on Russia. Ukraine, he said, will never submit. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. There is outrage and concern tonight after Iran executed three men for their roles during last year's widespread anti-government protest. That brings the number of people tied to those protests who have been executed to at least seven. Margaret Evans tells us why many fear more Iranians could face the same fate. Demonstrators gathered outside the Iranian embassy here in London as news of the latest execution spread. A small but determined crowd worried that the plight of Iranian protesters is slipping from the world's gaze. They get shot. They get uh, beaten up, they, they were put to prison, and as you can see, they can be executed with no fair trial. Saeed Yagubi, Majid Kazami, and Salah Mir Hashemi were arrested last November in the city of Isfahan, accused of involvement in the deaths of three security force members. They were charged with enmity against God. Which is consistently used by the revolutionary course in Iran to uh, eliminate and target political dissidents. Nationwide protests against Iran's governing clerics swept the country last September in the wake of Masa Amini's death, 
Well, she was in the custody of the morality police. After the three men were executed today, Iran's judiciary published on its website footage of them allegedly confessing. Testimony obtained, according to Amnesty International, under duress. Repeatedly beaten, hung upside down, given electric shocks, threatened with rape, threatened with the death of their family members. Human rights groups want a strong reaction from the international community. The situation is as bad, if not worse, than what it was in November, when there was that global outpouring of support. The, it's not over. <laughs> Images posted on social media showed friends and family of the three men grieving at grave sites. And as night fell, there were images too of more protests underway. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Ontario's Premier says the province is sweetening a deal to secure an electric vehicle battery plant in Windsor. I will confirm we're, we're putting more money uh, on the table. Solantis was due to open the facility next year, creating 2,500 new jobs. But last week, the company slowed construction and said it's looking at contingency plans, adding the federal government hasn't kept up with promises. Doug Ford says a formal announcement on the matter will be made soon, but he wouldn't provide a dollar figure on the province's cash injection. A funeral home in Quebec is offering a space for loved ones to gather for medical assistance in dying. Some say it highlights a gap in the health care system, but as Alison Northcott tells us, the province has other concerns. Welcome, follow me. Funeral homes have been in Mathieu Baker's family for generations, but he recently expanded the kind of service he offers. So this is the room where you have the medical aid in dying? Yes, this is, this is where it, uh, it happens. People who are approved for medical assistance in dying can come here with their doctor and loved ones to end their lives at a cost of at least $700. It's a lot of um, organization uh, on, on our part to, to really make it a respectful and uh, meaningful event for, the, for that family. It's what Michel Brunel recently opted for. His family says he had emphysema and his quality of life had deteriorated, but he didn't want to die at home or in the hospital. They're using a room that they have already, uh, decorated it very nicely, uh, allowed us the time we needed to do what we had to do, to say goodbye, let him get comfortable. Uh, it's, just, it's just a beautiful option. A growing number of Quebecers have opted for medical assistance in dying since it became legal, from 63 people in 2015-16 to more than 3,000 in 2021-22. But this doctor says services to a company made outside of hospitals lag behind. That it really underscores lack of access, lack of resources in the public health care system right now to have rooms available for people who do not want to receive their maid at home. Tecla Henderson is with a nonprofit that offers free space to people for maid in Toronto and says some community groups and funeral homes are filling a gap. The system really started from a legislation and a medical model, and now we're aware of the community-based supports that need to come. A spokesperson for the Gabat government says it's important to ensure medical assistance in dying doesn't become monetized, and is looking at the legality of funeral homes offering spaces for people to die. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. One week after the Toronto Maple Leafs' disappointing playoff finish, the team is parting ways with its general manager. I felt that the long-term future of the Maple Leafs might have to change. Why some think it could be just the first of more big moves to come. Next. Behind the 90s sitcom style, a new show tackles some big issues. I'm excited and a little nervous. Eli Glasner uncovers the true story that inspired it. What better way to mark your 100th birthday? Why are you having your birthday at the pool? Because they know I love the water. An Ontario woman celebrates with a splash. We're back in two. <laughs> Princess Anne arrived in Moncton by military helicopter. Part of our visit to New Brunswick to the, on the weekend to mark the 175th anniversary of the 8th Canadian Hussars, Canada's oldest armoured regiment. She laid a wreath at the RCMP memorial before taking part in a regimental service.
It's the end of an era for the Toronto Maple Leafs. In a move that took many by surprise, the team is letting its general manager go. Thomas Daglin now with a major change to the team's front office and the potential impact on the ice. From Stanley Cup favorites at the start of the month to now this. There is no nice summer or finish line just for having partial success. The Maple Leafs are letting general manager Kyle Dubas walk. Not long after Toronto advanced to the second round of the playoffs for the first time in 19 years. Then came the collapse against Florida and now hints of a rebuild. I felt that the long-term future of the Maple Leafs might have to change. Right off the forehead. Dubas became known for his in-game meltdowns. He acknowledged this week the job has been especially tough on his family. It's been a very taxing year on them, um, and uh, that's uh, obviously very important to me. Uh, he might not want to do this. The Leafs president admits Dubas's honesty at the mic contributed to the team's decision. I think at that point, it, there was a shift in, in, in my thinking at that moment, a dramatical shift in my thinking. Perennially disappointed Leafs fans turn into summer Blue Jays fans, but still wonder about the next hockey season. I'm a Leafer from way back, and let's get it done. Like, you know. Question marks hang over Leafs coach Sheldon Keefe, even stars like Mitch Marner, Austin Matthews, and William Nylander. We don't know exactly what's going to happen, but this is the first domino, the Dubas domino, if, if you will, to fall. All of it at a time of big transitions for Canadian NHL clubs, with the Calgary Flames also in need of a new GM and the Ottawa Senators searching for the team's next owner. Canadian sprinting legend Donovan Bailey, the latest name, joining a bid that also involves Snoop Dogg. I'm 100% a Leafs fan today, but I'm definitely getting on board being a Sens fan because this, this, means, this means a little bit more, small little bit more. No matter the team, being a fan isn't getting easier. Next season, Canada's Stanley Cup drought enters its fourth decade. Thomas Dagler, CBC News, Toronto. Jim Brown, considered one of the greatest running backs in NFL history, has died at the age of 87. He began in 1957 playing for Cleveland and gained a reputation for being unstoppable on the rush, smashing records. But he shocked fans by retiring from the NFL after just nine seasons to become a Hollywood actor, starring in hit films like The Dirty Dozen. He was arrested several times over the years, often accused, though never convicted, of violence against women. A longtime civil rights activist, he launched programs to support black-owned businesses and stop gang violence. Brown's family said he was a loving husband, father, and grandfather, and that he passed away peacefully at his L.A. home. A new Canadian TV show is bringing a sitcom style to some difficult issues, focusing on the life of a group of kids living in foster care. She taught me how to stand up straight and keep my head up high and that I didn't need to be ashamed of my journey in being a foster kid. Coming up, the real life inspiration behind it. And the community choir bringing voices and hearts together. Nothing to you. It's like a birthday party for the song. My interview with the duo behind Choir, Choir, Choir. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping our world. Next. A new sitcom for kids is promising to shed light on what life is like growing up in the foster care system in Canada. Eli Glasner takes us to the set of Auntie B's house where he discovered the real life inspiration behind the show. To take your experience and now to put it out there is, I mean, that's, that's a gift, that's something. Yeah, it's, it's a dream come true and I get very overwhelmed by Sorry. An emotional moment for the creator of a new kind of show. In a Toronto studio where laughs and tears are not uncommon, Auntie B's house is taking shape. They take one A only, Mark. It's a home for Zach, Khadija, and Shelly, all kids in foster care. As their foster mom, Auntie B, Kalayla Brooks knows the home well because it's built on her own experience. I was in foster care from the ages of two and aged out until I was 21. 
I um, lived in group homes, uh, many different foster homes in uh, Nova Halifax, Nova Scotia, or just Nova Scotia overall. It wasn't easy for Brooks being in school as a foster kid. Everyone knew and I stood out. So that was hard. Uh, you always, and I was tall. I'm a tall woman. Yeah. So um, because I was tall and plus my clothing didn't look good. I wasn't kept, meaning, you know, I might not have brushed my hair. I might not have brushed my teeth because when you're so young, you don't have those life skills or those hygienic skills. So you just learn as you're old, you just get dressed and go to school. Behind the colorful sets and sitcom vibes is an idea, a place where kids can feel love no matter what their family looks like. I'm excited and a little nervous. Mm -hmm. I felt the exact same way when my family would visit me at my foster home when I was younger. All inspired by Brooke's real life foster mom. She taught me how to stand up straight and keep my head up high and that I didn't need to be ashamed of my journey and being a foster kid and that she was going to teach me how to be loved. Executive producer Michelle Melanson was visiting Centennial College when Brooks first pitched the character she'd created for theater shows. One of the reasons the story clicked is Melanson's husband, co-executive producer Ken Kupris, was himself adopted. He grew up with social services as part of his life. He came to me and said, how do you feel about adopting um, for our second child? So we actually went to China and adopted our daughter, and she was in the foster system when we got her at 11 months old. Everyone involved here wants to make a show willing to take on the real issues foster kids face. I think often we present too much of a rosy view. I think sometimes it's all the happy and none of the really the things that we're all feeling and seeing, and that doesn't make kids feel like it's uber relatable to them at home. Kids do cry, kids get angry. And to be explores the anxiety when a parent visits. Hmm, what should we do first? Whether the tooth fairy will be able to find Shelly's new home or Khadija still hanging on to a very special item. Khadija, what's going on? Why don't you want to get rid of those old shoes? Because my mom gave them to me and they're special, okay? Even with Antibi's youngest actors, there's a feeling the show special. I've never told a story like this. Everything's always been way different. I think that it'll show that all families are kind of different and just it's always beautiful in your own way. And that is very much the point. This is about finding new yeah. families yeah. and different kinds of families. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is about letting those children know that somebody loves them. Mm -hmm. Were you, you can take a moment if you need it, but it's okay, you can come in and... Sorry, Shao. <laughs> Don't be sorry, Precious. This is so <clears throat> real. This is... No, I mean, that's what it's yeah. about. Yeah. And that's what's so beautiful about this. It's okay to be sad sometimes. While NTB's is an imagined place, there's a very real shortage of foster parents in many parts of Canada, something this organizer thinks the show could help inspire. I think it's an excellent goal for the show. Um, the people that come forward to you know, express their interest in, and eventually become foster care providers, they are some of the most compassionate, kind, warm, nurturing people that I have met. Uh, and they do make a significant difference uh, in the lives of children and youth. And for those worried young viewers aren't ready for the situations foster kids face, the fact that their stories aren't being told. And so this show is about inspiring children. And even though the topics are difficult, it's all about being able to let them know that even in difficult conversations, there's somebody here to listen and someone here to see them through those challenges. And Eli, the people behind this have high hopes for the show. They certainly do. I've spoken with the showrunner and executive producer, and they think their audience, their younger audience, is ready. Melanson jokes calling this full house for littles. So I think the idea is that there is love and there are laughs, but that this show could be a, a vehicle for empathy. And perhaps if a child from the foster care system comes into the classroom, that there will be, uh, I think, a, a greater sense of understanding. But I, I remember talking to Kayla, and she was saying, that at one point she thought of becoming a teacher or even a foster mom herself, but now with the creation of this character, Auntie B, and there being a real need out there, it could inspire a new generation of foster caregivers. Nice story. Thanks, Eli. My pleasure. You can watch Auntie B's house this fall on CBC Television and CBC Gym. A play in Toronto is also trying to make a difference in children's lives. As Deanna Sumanak-Johnson shows us, it's shedding light on a dark past in hopes of a brighter future. 
in 1933, we Jews, we live south of Harvard Street. On this sunny day, a field trip to see a play about a dark chapter of Canadian history, the Christie Pitts riot of 1933. Along with many Italians, that's our turf. In the shadow of Hitler's rise to power, an explosion of violent anti-Semitism right here in Toronto. During a baseball game between two local teams, swastika-wielding members of the Pitt gang clashed with Jewish and Italian immigrants. I'm grateful that we're partnering with school boards across Ontario to help make real our history and come up with contemporary intersections with how hate in 1933 still manifests today in 2023. I am a young Jewish Canadian. I've had similar experiences in a similar sports context. And this, I felt, was shocking. How should this be new history to me? The author of this graphic novel on the Christie Pitts riot thinks it holds a lesson on intolerance and should be taught in schools across Canada. I think that sharing that story and understanding that history uh, lets us learn from it. The play has left an impact on Toronto kids who got to see it first. Honestly, it was a great experience to sit and watch it and see how it was like. The way the Italians and Jewish people stood up for each other uh, throughout the racism, even though they knew it could get themselves hurt, I think uh, that should happen more often. The play, staged by Toronto theatre group The Hogtown Collective, will run throughout May and June. A banner with the swastika appeared at a baseball game and we tore it down. The goal is to get as many Toronto students to see it as possible and eventually tweak it for a more mature audience. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. When we come back, the Canadian choir that's got the attention of some big name stars. The duo that started the pop up sensation reflects on what draws so many to it to invite people into a room and celebrate these songs in what I think is the best possible way to celebrate them. My interview with the founders of Choir, 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 next. There is magic when choir, choir, choir performs. That's them at Massey Hall earlier this year. The pop-up community choir started as a one-off event back in 2011. Now they perform at packed venues around the world. I met the two founders of the group back in February when they tried and failed to draw me into this like public singing thing. Uh, they are ramping up for a busy summer, so we thought we'd share part of that conversation again. Ian, are you ready for the trademarked choir, choir, choir vocal warm-up? I mean, I'm a little uncomfortable, but let's give it a shot. Okay, David will give you a note. I'll count you in. Okay. Okay, here we go. One, two, three, go! I'm not ready to do this, but I am ready to ask them lots of questions after a little bit of background on choir, choir, choir. It's such a simple concept and yet so popular. Amateur singers who in an evening become a joyous pop-up choir. Like a lot of great ideas, it started by accident. This one at a birthday party for a friend. On the count of three, everyone take a nice deep breath. One, two, three. Hold it in for eight minutes. <laughs> Nobu Edelman and David Goldman perfected choir, choir, choir at Toronto bars, eventually landing theatre shows, even a spot on US TV. Along the way, attracting the attention of some big stars. Everybody, David Byrne. They have crisscrossed North America and are about to embark on a tour of the UK. I sat down with Nobu and David at one of their old venues, Clinton's Tavern in Toronto. At what point did you guys know you had a thing? This idea of ordinary people getting together, being led through a song, how captivating it was, but, but when did you realize it was gonna work? We've had, I think we've had many different phases of that. You know, after the first official choir, choir, choir night, it was held at a friend's real estate office. At the end of the night, you know, we literally had no plan. At the end of the night, we said, oh, we'll do this in a few months again at some point, you know, and people were like, no, tomorrow. 
And then we ended up doing it every single week for a year before we started doing it twice a week. So that was probably the first night where we realized, oh, that really went well. But as much as it went well, we still basically have no plan. And, uh, but we knew early on, like within a couple of weeks, it was clear that I didn't know what it was gonna become, but it was clear that there was something there. So there are a handful of amazing moments along the way for choir, choir, choir. How many times do I have to say that? Just CCC or something? And Every know. single time say choir, choir, choir. Okay, um, and, and one of them is Rick Astley. Call me David, 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 by the way, in case <laughs> okay, David, you don't David, mind. David. Um, so Rick Astley, yeah. you, you got him to walk in here. How, how did that even come about? He was walking by, and <laughs> no, no, it, Nobu was actually away that week, and I and and I was like, I should do it. Like, we're never going to give you up. I had seen that Rick Astley was on tour, so we did this night here. Yeah. Hey, Rick Astley, we want you to come and sing with us. We're choir, choir, choir. We will sing with you. We love your music. We celebrate music, and you have some wicked songs, man. So I kind of dared him to come and sing with us. He, he sends me the footage. I'm in Paris at the time, and I edited it together. And we put the video out. And by the time I got back from my trip, our... Rick Astley's team had gotten in touch and were like, we'll come by. Wow. And on the, and the night of, we're here. The, the bar is packed with people. They're so excited because we said, look, Rick's going to be here. Hi, guys. Let's go have a sing song. Come on. We taught the arrangement. Rick's not in the room. And then right at the moment, we're like, all right. Everybody, Rick Astley, he comes walking through the bar. We do the song. We haven't even spoken to him. One take, he nailed it. His voice was amazing. And then he's like, all right, I'm done. And we're like, well, can we do it one more time? You know, we need a few more camera angles. But it was, it was that easy. The other thing that's really striking about that video for me is how much people who were singing, the ordinary people who were, I guess, standing around here, how much joy they had. They just loved it. What is it about what you guys do, what they do, that brings so much joy, do you think? I mean, music really matters to people. Not to everybody, but to a lot of people, it matters almost as much as anything. Like, music to people is like a part of who they are. You know, so to invite people into a room and celebrate these songs in what I think is the best possible way to celebrate them is to sing them and make them a beautiful new thing. Um, people just love it and they, people love celebrations. It's like a birthday party for the song. But it's not just the song, right? It's the Absolutely. act of singing together. It's about being shoulder to shoulder with people. It's about hearing the harmonies creep in slowly, realizing that you could be part of something like that. It, it can be overwhelming at times, at just how much joy we also collectively feel together. Watching some of the videos, I sense heavily weighted towards women. You have a lot more women than men. Is that something you see in your shows generally? We only let a certain percentage of men allowed yeah. are allowed to come to a certain <laughs> night. You know, so you it's have like to, a nightclub. Every every club has its rules. That's right. You know, we have we've hired bouncers specifically. <laughs> we're like let certain attractive men in. No, I mean it's. I mean I think the vulnerability is. Nobu said people want to share. They want to be vulnerable, which is only partly true. I think we've, you know, people want to be in that kind of space, but we try to unlock that in them through humor and through, you know, whatever we're doing, we create that space that allows them to be vulnerable with people around them. And men are just not as open to doing that. A, a lot of guys show up to our shows because they've been dragged there by their partners or, you know, they've just found themselves there and you can tell that they don't really want to be there. Mm -hmm. But then the humor aspect of our show is so huge that make them feel included. So they're laughing, their guards are down. And then by the end of the show, they're singing along just as loudly as whoever they came with it, which I Everyone love. Like, yeah. I love you know, seeing like, that. I mean, he talks a good game, but the reality is, and I believe this to be true, that if, certainly for me, that if we didn't run choir, 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 and someone's like, we should go to this night, they're singing, there's two guys yeah. who tell you what to sing, I'd be like, that's okay. Yeah. Like, I don't know. It's hard to be definitive about this, but I think, and, and you guys think, you're the first to do this in the way that you do it, right? Uh, yeah. Like I mean, groups have sung before, obviously, together, right? Amateurs have sung before, but there's, you, what you guys do is it, it may be unique. 
or, or not, if not unique, when you started it, it was unique. We started in 2011, and, I, and, and, and it was, you know, we started doing these nights, and we would record it on an iPhone. But then it sort of evolved, the nights got bigger. We were getting so much attention, seemingly from local media, and whatever. And I was like, how are we, the, I would be Googling, like, choir, like, you know, like Im, just like impromptu, like video, like New York, t Tokyo, London, anywhere. So give me figuring there's got to be someone doing this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I would say to Nova, like, I don't think there's anyone else in the world doing what we do. And f I know for some reason I was so proud of that. Yeah, Not because absolutely. we were like, we came up with an idea, but just because we happened to in some way stumble upon something we really love doing that no one else was doing. I mean, subsequently there are people doing what we do and they were inspired by us, which is great. Is it great? It's half great. <laughs> because I'm curious about that too, right? I, I, I don't know if you, I mean, we could call them copycats. We could call them inspired by choir, choir, choir. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, yeah, we have, you we must have, have mixed we have, we have different ideas about it. You go first. I mean, I, you know, I'm of two minds. Like in one, in one sense, I'm like proud that we created something that means enough to people that there are other people who are like, oh, we should do something like that here and it, it becomes successful or there's varying degrees of success. But at the same time, I think of this as like our baby and like I think of it as like something that we like just worked so hard to build up. You know, if someone sees it and says, oh, that's a great idea, two people on stage with 2,000 people, let's get, and there's some money behind it, they can kind of make it happen, which is great. But I just know how long we spent to yeah. get to that point, organic growth, which I think is why our performance is so sharp. I appreciate the honesty, um, but I guess another part of that though is you can feel confident that you maybe have created a genre. Yeah, I, you know, I, I feel that nobody owns singing, you know? I think that um, whenever I get anxious messages from David about, you know, some of his deep research that he does about other choirs and what they're doing, I'm just like, no one is going to do it the way we're doing it. This is DIY. This is about the creatives figuring out a way for them for how to, how to exercise their creativity and figure it out on their own. Come up with their own arrangements. When we first started doing arrangements, it was David and I listening to a song, singing parts in the margins to each other, recording the parts on an iPhone, showing up to whatever venue we were doing it at, and trying to figure it out in the moment. And it was that sweat, and it was that kind of just no roadmap that I find, as a creative person, very exciting. And so the soul of choir, I feel, is born out of that. So any other choir that they're doing it, I hope that they're doing it, if they're copying what our model, I hope that they're taking that route, because then that means that they're having an authentic experience. So I can't buy the Vancouver franchise, apparently. Talk to us in five years, <laughs> because uh, uh, in five years we might be willing to do that. <laughs> okay, so I don't want the Vancouver franchise, but I would like to be part of one of those nights. I, I was too embarrassed at the beginning of that to do it on my own, but to be part of a group. Next time they're in Vancouver, do a leap of songs, perhaps? I'm 100% there. You recording this, <laughs> monkey you? <laughs> 100 years old and just as vibrant as ever. Her birthday pool party is our moment. Barbara Edwards, who turned 100 years old yesterday, has been attending Aquafit classes at the community pool in London, Ontario, three times a week for the past 28 years. COVID had kept her away recently, but it couldn't stop her from spending her 100th birthday at her favorite place. Her triumphant return to the pool is our moment. Okay, Barbara, why are you having your birthday at the pool? Why am I having it? Because they know I love the water. Why? Why? Because I love the water. It's amazing, it's a milestone. Um, yeah, it's been 28 years she's been here at the pool. 28 years. What? <laughs> That's right. She loves people, loves helping people, loves being with people. It's great. It's a wonderful place. Yes, I've had good times there. Look at her. She's amazing. Really wonderful woman. Thank you so much Are for you chatting with us. In the pool? I'm not coming in. Oh, what a shame. Are you? The amount of light this woman exudes is infectious, and it's undeniable that she is going to be a positive part of your life. You recording this? <laughs> you monkey, you. <laughs> <laughs> 100 is the new, I don't know, 85. You notice that there is a sub-theme in some of these moments of people who are doing 
physical activities at years that maybe like uh, a generation ago would have seemed too old and seems absolutely normal now. It's nothing cute or unusual about that. It's a hundred year old person staying active in the pool and obviously very comfortable with that and so nice to share that moment on the program this evening. That is the National for May 19th. David Common will be doing cross-country checkup and the National on Sunday. Have a good night.